have been preparing a series of events and a great ceremony. This very special moment will also be marked by the launching of the book entitled Atma Jaya Lima Rutao Tuhan Dan Tanahai or Atma Jaya 50 years for God and Madam. May now we request your eminence to sign on the inscription.
Your Eminence, Cardinal Jean Louis Turron, Your Excellency Apostolic Nuncio Archbishop Lipodo Girelli, His Excellency Monsignor Ignacio Suhadio, Boards of the Atmajaya Foundation, Rector of Atmajaya Catholic University of Indonesia, Respectable Guest, Ladies and Gentlemen, we must begin our extraordinary program today by wishing you a very warm welcome to your eminence, Cardinal Jean Louis Turon. It is a great honor for us to host a lecture on the role of universities in interreligious dialogue by your eminence, Cardinal Jean Louis Turon. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, may we invite Father Adi Prasojo to lead our opening prayer. Your Eminence, Jean Louis Cardinal Toran. Your Eminence, Julius Cardinal Dermot Mojo. Your Excellency, Monsignor Ignacio Suario. Your Excellency, Monsignor Ioan Espujo Zubarto. Your Excellency, Monsignor Leopoldo Girelli, Apostle Nuncio in Indonesia. The Head of Admajaya Foundation, Director, or Vice Director, Professors and the Students. Let us raise and we start our seminar today with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. O oh Lord, we thank for your blessing and grace today, especially for attending His Eminence, Sia Louis Cardinal Toran, among us. We are very grateful for His Eminence, Sia Louis Cardinal Toran, because He has given His precious time to be here with us. We hope your Holy Spirit bless us in this seminar. Therefore, we can active to take a part in bringing peace into our nation and the worldwide. We wish that everyone who attends this seminar inspired to respect the diversity among us and can make a unity to praise and worship in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord, now and forever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to invite Rector Professor F.G. Vinaro to come and deliver his welcoming address. Your Excellency Archbishop Leopold Irelli, Apostolic Nuncio to Indonesia. Your Excellency Archbishop Ignatius Suharyo, the co adjutor Archbishop of Jakarta. His Excellency Ambassador Indonesia to Vatican. Monsignor. Fathers, sisters, distinguished guests, and friends, ladies and gentlemen. May I, on behalf of the University and the Foundation, wish you a very good morning and welcome to Atmajaya Catholic University. First of all, please allow me to express my sincere gratitude and thanks to your eminence for your willingness to grant our humble request to kindly visit our campus to inspire and to share with us your vast experience of worldview, dimension, and interreligious inter cooperation and dialogues despite the very limited time you have and on the Muslim holiday of Idul Adha. I fail to hide my happiness 
having a great privilege and honor and pleasure to receive you personally and to welcome you. You are in the Please allow me once again to give you a bird's eye view about our university. When it was built and established by young Catholic scholars, which until today is still the only Catholic university in Jakarta. To date, the university has student body for over 12,000 and more than 50% of them are non Catholics. Atmajaya consists of two campuses. The first is here, and the other is the second campus that houses the Faculty of Medicine and Hospital. The third campus is in the planning state, which will be developed in the outskirts of Jakarta at Bumi Serpongane. One of the university's goals is to be a global, local university, which means that this university should be internationally recognized as a good quality university and continue in preserving and developing the local wisdom, culture, and Indonesian nationalisms with deep appreciation of tolerance and impressive pluralisms. Bearing the name of Catholics in the country with the largest Muslim population in the world, the vision of impressive pluralisms and spirit of tolerance is indeed necessary. The name Atmajaya means the spirit prevails. The university shall reflect the embracement of the Holy Spirit and Pancasila the Indonesian five principles upon which the Indonesian state is built. The ex corda ecclesia should reflect the academic daily life in this university, which honor moral value and solidarity and tries to keep that Catholicism is a civilization of love and the university is the house of God. We must try hard to foster a sense of solidarity among ourselves based on the mutual love and respect, even though in daily practices it is often difficult to follow. The struggle and effort are indeed greatly challenging, but we have every reason to be proud of our achievement to bring this university as one of the top private university in the country. Your Eminence, your vision to this campus at Atmajaya University is indeed enormous valuable for us. Not only as it is known further more deeply about the value theological dialogues between peoples of different faith, but also, it is to strengthen our intellectual tradition, our own faith, and our human dignity. In June next year, Atmajaya is going to celebrate its golden anniversary. Your present, I believe, will be a great opportunity for everyone who is present today to attain spiritual enlightenment from you. Therefore, Your Eminence, I would humbly and earnestly request your special favor for giving us a brief lecture and guidance to boost our moral spirit and self-confidence. I thank you very much, Your Eminence. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are very much honored to have here with us His Eminent Jean-Louis Cardinal Pierre Toro. At this rare and wonderful occasion, he, His Eminence is going to share with us his insight and expert knowledge on a crucial issue. 
the role of universities in interreligious dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome His Eminent Jean-Louis Cardinal Pierre Toro. Mr. Rector, your Eminence, Your Excellency Apostolic Nunchuk, dear friends, you heard, like me, that the Rector invited me to give a brief lecture. So I shall be brief. <laughs> Uh, let me first say Terima Kasir. <laughs> Terima Kasir for your kind welcome here today. I'm very much impressed by the very beautiful and, uh, I should say, very clean and appealing premises of your university. I would like to express also my personal joy in being here for the first time as President of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue to visit the Catholic University at Mayaya and to be with you, Rector Professor Milano, the professors and the students present and the friends of the University as well. I am very happy to be in this welcoming country rich of its great variety of religions, ethnicities, traditions, languages, and cultures. Indonesia is a clear demonstration that harmony can match with diversity. This is surely not without challenges faced mostly by the minorities, despite of the fact that this diversity is an integral part of your history your existence, and your future in this country. I am glad to note that as Jaya is one of the leading Catholic universities in this country, which has a significant role to play in order to consistently reflect the merging of Christian faith, science, technology, and Indonesian culture in an attempt to educate the nation. The preparation of Christians, religious and lay men and women, in order to meet the believers of other religious traditions, remain the first order of necessity. I should say this is one of the priorities of the present Pope. One cannot improvise dialogue. He or she must be well prepared, must study, must interchange with other co-believers, must pray. This being said, the promotion of interreligious dialogue is the responsibility of all Christians, in particular in everyday life. To dialogue with believers of other religions, and with the Muslims in particular, is a deep spiritual experience because you are pressed to give witness and to speak about your own faith. Only convinced Christians are qualified to engage in interreligious dialogue. And I think this such dialogue as its base rests on three convictions. The first, we must have a clear idea of your own religion. We cannot dialogue on ambiguity. Catechesis in parishes and teaching in seminaries and universities are particularly important. Second conviction, we have to live according to our beliefs. We have to be credible believers because in interreligious dialogue we are always exposed to, other, to the other's gaze. And the third conviction, we must not be shy in sharing our faith. We must be honest. If I am convinced that Christ is the answer to the riddles of human conditions, I cannot keep to myself what I consider to be the key to 
for happiness. So, you may ask, what is the essence of interreligious dialogue? It is not a question of being nice to the other. It is not a negotiation, like, for example, in the diplomatic life. You solve a problem and it's over. This is not a strategy to convert the other. It is rather an invitation to discover the seeds of the world, the ray of the truth, the signs of the presence of God in every brother and sister in humanity. With interreligious dialogue, we are compelled to promote all positive and constructive relationship with persons and communities in order to learn how to know each other and to enrich each other in obedience to the truth and respect for the freedom of everyone. Interreligious dialogue is not therefore the search for the smallest common denominator among religions, that would be relativism. It is indeed the endeavour to know and to respect the convictions of the other and to recognise that God never ceases to be present and to be at work in the heart of every human person. Interreligious dialogue is also a providential call inviting us to deepen our own beliefs in order to be able to answer to those ask, who are asking for an account of our religion. That is to make, that is, just to remember what Peter wrote to the Christian of Rome, always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you for a reason for your hope. Dialogue claims also mutual knowledge among believers, leading to a greater respect and understanding. It is also an occasion to correct erroneous images which exist, to overcome stereotypes and misconceptions which distort true knowledge of the other. If problems arise between Christian and Muslims, very often they are due to ignorance. Very often we do not know the content of other religions, or we have never met believers of other religions. We are reluctant to meet followers of other religions because sometimes we have no clear idea about our own religion. And of course, we cannot under-evaluate violence perpetrated in the name of religion or the discrimination of religious minorities in countries where the majority religion <coughs> enjoys a privileged status due to history. Only convinced Christians are qualified to engage in interreligious dialogue. Only Christians who live according to their convictions are qualified for interreligious dialogue. As I said before, we have to be credible believers because in interreligious dialogue we are exposed to the other's gaze. We ask one another, who is your God? How do you live your religious, your religious faith in everyday life? And everyone must personally answer such questions. Interreligious dialogue does not happen between religions, but between believers. We mustn't be shy in sharing our faith. If I am convinced that Christ is the answer to the riddles of human conditions, I cannot keep to myself what I consider to be the key to happiness. And this is exactly what the Pope recalled to the Roman Curia in December 2007, when he said, 
those who have recognized a great truth or discovered a great joy have to pass it home. They absolutely cannot keep it to themselves. These great gifts are never intended for only one person. In Jesus Christ, a great light emerged for us. The great light. We cannot put it under a bushel basket. We must set it on a lamp's fan so that it will give light to all who are in the house. Finally, Christian and Muslims who dialogue are a great help for peace and harmony between societies and people. Together, sometimes in a very secularized society, they can give witness to prayer. We can help each other to behave as responsible citizens. We can work in order that religious freedom be more and more a reality. We can defend the family against aggressive policies which are undermining its solidity. We can fight together against illiteracy and disease. We are aware of our common responsibility for the moral formation of younger generations. If I may say so, believers are prophets of hope. They do not believe in fate. They know that gifted by God with a heart and an intelligence, they can, with his help, change the course of history in order to orientate their life according to the project of God. That is to say, make of humanity an authentic family of which each one of us is a man. Yes, we have the heart to love and the intelligence to understand. Anyway, for us Christians, we must remember Paul's exhortation in the letter to the Romans. Let us then pursue what leads to peace and to building up one another. This is, for us, a beautiful roadmap. But since Cain and Abel, exclusivism and the desire for security have been always in the heart of man. History, like religions, teach that there is only one possible future, a shared future. That is why interreligious dialogue has become a necessity. Interreligious dialogue, you must never forget it, always begins by welcoming and respecting the other, as the Protestant theologian of Yale University, Miroslav Vaughan, wrote. I quote it. I quote him be my last word. Embracing, I open my arms to create a space in me for the other. The open arms show that I do not want only to remain isolated and that I address an invitation to the other to come, to feel at home with me. In a mutual embrace, no one remains intact because each one enriches the other and yet both of them remain themselves. I think there cannot be a better conclusion to my words. Thank you so much. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are now inviting um, three questions from the audience. Your Eminence, Jean Louis Cardinal Turon. My name is Eka Budianta. My school diploma says Christophorus Apollinaris Eka Budianta. 
and I'm proud to be a Catholic. Only a few months ago, however, during the political campaign of our general election, one of our political leaders had a little problem because his wife was suspected to be a Catholic. How do you, how do she, I, I would like to hear from his eminence, how should we react, how should we behave when our pride is hurt, when our things that we are happy about is disturbed. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask because I didn't hear very well. Sorry, because I didn't hear very well. Of course, I am in Indonesia since two days and I have not the pretension to resolve all the problems of the country. <laughs> so I think that in such, um, in such a difficult uh, situation, what is important, first of all, is to clarify the elements of the problem. Because sometimes uh, many difficulties come from ignorance or misconception. So, in that case, the first, the first move is to dialogue again. But, and also to remind the, part, the partners, uh, for example, in the public, in the society, of the, of the law. Here, for example, you have the Pankashila, and this is the basis of your, um, of your social life, as far as I understood. So, uh, we have to... to, to to, how to say, to respect and to be to abide by the by the magnificent, beautiful principles which are enshrined in this philosophy. But what is important is to, to identify the problem and to uh, and to respect the law, because in a, in a democratic society, law must prevail over uh, the, over how to say violence in facts and in, 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 in words. Thank you, Raymond. Um, I am Fabi Julius, a fine word missionary. Okay. I am the director of Bidyaman Bira Catholic University of Kupang, East Nusa Tenggara, Indonesia. There are more than 10 Catholic universities here in Indonesia, and we have more non-Catholic students than Catholic students. And last week, all directors of the Catholic University here in Indonesia, we gathered together in a day of study about how we define our identity as Catholic among the many non-Catholic students. And we found, although we were guided by export the Ecclesia's ideas, but we find sometimes very difficult how to solve our Catholic identity amongst that kind of situation. There's like a tension of being Catholic, but being tolerant to most of our students, and also because we are the minority in the East. So, what would you say about this situation? Thank you. Well, as I said before, uh, in interreligious dialogue, what is important, first of all, is to have a very clear cut spiritual identity. Because ambiguity is the worst enemy of dialogue. So, for us Christians, in, in a society like yours, uh, first of all is to have a very clear idea of the content of, the, of, of our faith, because our, our faith is not, is not a, a romantic feeling. Our faith is content, and uh, it's not a myth. For example, Christ, Jesus Christ lived in a certain part of the world, in a certain history, at a certain moment of the Roman Empire history, and so on. So there are historical facts that we must know. We have also the teaching of the church, which, are, which uh, define our, our beliefs. So there is a great um, effort to, to carry on in order to pass over the content of the faith. And this is what I was saying there is this morning, the complementarity of this book compared to the, to the previous one. John Paul II gave to the church visibility. Uh, Benedict XVI is giving to the church 
his interiority. It's a pop, it's a pope who teaches. And I think this is a great service he can give to humanity. And I, I shall tell you a little fact which uh, happened to me uh, just uh, three months after the election of Benedict XVI. I was in the street of Rome and a lady coming back from the market uh, stopped me and said, Father, this, this Pope is an extraordinary man because he said very profound things, but we understand everything. And I think she catches exactly the charisma of this Pope. It's a Pope who teaches. And to answer your question, uh, identity means we are aware of our faith and we, are, we must be proud of our faith. See? I should, I, 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 should, I should welcome, for example, the celebration of a Christian pride. Thank you. Uh, Your Eminence, uh, my name is Bernadette Sathiavi. I'm the professor in psychology here. I used to work at the State University for about 28 years. And through that experience, I find that dialogue of life in terms of interreligious dialogue is, uh, is very helpful in the sense that we have the opportunity to know the others at a personal level. Now, if we have students at the Catholic University that they later on will work with in a community where the majority are non-Catholics, could you give um, an advice? How would we prepare our Catholic students in order to be able to have this dialogue of life in their life, in their professions? Thank you. Well, I shall repeat what I've said in the pre my previous answer, but I should add something else. That in that case, what is important is that the Catholic, minority Catholic, be member of the community. We mustn't be left alone. They must feel the, the comfort, the psychological and spiritual comfort of the community. Because our faith is always lived in a community, with, with, with the church. So many of, uh, of the, of, I, I'm, I am referring myself, for example, to the drama of uh, foreign students, Catholic foreign students in a, in a country, which is not their country, uh, they are completely lost. If they are left alone, they cannot resist to the pressure. Instead, if they are a member of a community, for example, if they are an uh, uh, association of uh, uh, young students, a parish uh, for the students, uh, a special liturgy at the, uh, every week for them, so they, they, they feel they are a member of a family and the family is supporting them. So I think this is, you, you mustn't be only, you mustn't be only a learned Christian, a goodwill Christian, you, you must be a member of the church, of the community. And this is exactly what is very important for the non-Christian. They see a community of believers. See, I remember I have been for many, many years the negotiator of the Holy See to the to the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, called the famous Helsinki process. And uh, since 1972 to 1981, practically we prepared the, the, the change of the regime in the Central and Eastern Europe, because all the philosophy was uh, practically shaped during these years, during this conference. And, uh, we, are, we were in, uh, around the table in alphabetic order, so Sanciation French, was very near the Union Sovietic, the Soviet Republic. And uh, we had very good, very good contact with the Soviet uh, diplomats. And I remember one of them who was a very militant atheist, but who was a very good friend of mine because we shared the same passion for Bach and Mozart. So through music, we became very good friends. And he told, he told me something which always uh, struck me. He said, we can accept that uh, you, uh, like many others, have metaphysical preoccupations. 
he was referring to religious preoccupation. This is all right. We don't object. But what we cannot accept is a community of believers. The community, the people of believers, because this is disturbing the secular society. So it's very important that we appear not only as independent individual believers, but believers who are worshipping together and we are witnessing their faith together in a society. Thank you, Your Eminence. My name is Katarina Sukanto. I'm the Vice Rector for Program Development and Collaboration. My question is a very practical one based on my own experience. Um, you just said that uh, we don't have to be shy of sharing our own faith. And I'm not, I'm not shy sharing my faith. I'm proud to be a Catholic. So when someone asks me what religion are you, I will, I will probably say I'm a Catholic. One day, I was asked by someone, what religion are you? I say, I'm a Catholic. So you believe in three gods then? I said, no, I believe in one God. And I was trying to explain to him the, uh, about the Trinity, but he didn't seem to understand my explanation. Um, Your Eminence, how would you see this kind of situation? Thank you. So, sorry, I, I didn't very understand. The question was, they asked you, uh, the, 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 the person who was talking to you said, You believe in three gods. Ah, you mean the Trinity? Yes. Ah, vis a vis Islam. Uh, all right. <laughs> because I didn't <laughs> So, well, this is a very, very recurrent question asked by our, our Muslim friends. Of course, as you know, uh, we, Christian and Muslim adore a unique God, but we have a different way to reach this God. So, um, among the names of God in the Islamic theology, there is one word which is missing, which is Father. This is a great difference between uh, the God of the Muslim and the God of Krishna. Our God is a Father. And uh, our um, perception of God, of course, is uh, helped by the revelation made by Jesus. We read in the Gospel of St. John, God, nobody saw him, but the Son who is next to him saw the, the, the Father and he told me, he told us who is God and who we are. So from Jesus we know that our God is a communion of love. The Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, and this uh, love is so intense that it becomes spirit, a, a kind of circulation of love because the Holy Spirit. So we what we say when God is, is Trinity, we say God is love. While our uh, Muslim brother had the, uh, the perception of God who is most essentially judge and omnipotent. And this is the difference of the, our attitude towards God. The, the Muslim is uh, prosterned to the soil in front of God, submitted to, to God. We are on our knees looking at God with our gaze up. So for us, our religion is a dialogue with somebody who is living with our, our father. For the Muslim, I think it is more or less the omnipotent God who will judge us at the end of the, of the, of the life. This is the, the, the difference, saying very poor English, I like my English, but anyway, I think you understood what I, what I meant. For us, it's very important that God is somebody with whom 
he spoke, and I, I can't take a shit. It's a quote what I read very recently. Uh, somebody who wrote, uh, when you speak about God like he, and not like you, so it, when you have like this dialogue with him, it means that the God's visage is disappearing. And very, very soon, God will become uh, an idea, and afterwards, only a word. So if, we, if the Christian is a man, a woman, who has a, a personal dialogue with God. Thank you for all your questions. Your evidence, would you please stay on the stage? Now we would like to invite Rector Professor Vinarno to come onto the stage to present our token of appreciation to your eminence, Cardinal Jean Louis Toron.